Just getting everything set up and I'm going live very informally. Truman is down here heavy breathing, but uh, we're going to get started. So thanks so much, first of all, for joining me. Michelle, hello, hello. Lady with gratitude, hello. Lady with gratitude, I think you're from, you're in Arizona, if I'm not mistaken. And we're going to bring everything up. So regardless of how you prefer to watch i've got you on facebook and on instagram but this is very the impromptu very very casual literally sundays for me are pool days so we are just inside so what i want to do is share with you a couple of things since wednesday night of this past week when i did um, a huge master class we had a great attendance talking about muscle loss after 50 and just going to double check that I have my volume up so that you are hearing me. Um, and I touched a little bit because muscle is connected to bone and bone density is also a huge concern for so many of us when we hit midlife and then after, you know, if it's not a concern in your fifties, it's probably going to be in your sixties and your seventies. And if you like, I have, parent, a mom or sister who has bone density challenges, they either hey, they know they have low bone density, meaning osteopenia, or they've been diagnosed with osteoporosis, or they've had fractures. Bing and bing in my department. So my mom's 94, and I think um, it was in her 80s, she fell while shoveling, which is a lot often how it happens. You realize you have osteopenia at that point and up to that point she said no i know i don't have it i don't have that I don't have that and then of course she fell and she fractured and and i said do you see now you've got this <laughs> and uh you know nobody wants to be right in those cases that's not the the goal by any means so hold on one second i'm going to disappear plug something in just to improve the lighting situation here and We'll see how well that goes. That should help just a little bit. Okay, tiny bit. So if you've got somebody in your family who experienced low bone density, but it wasn't until their 80s, that's not necessarily family history because we probably all are gonna get it. If we're gonna live that long. And I'll tell you why. We start losing our bone density at about age 30 it peaks so until that point when you've got young girls who you care for and love you know give them a jump rope as opposed to you know a swimsuit not that swimming is not great exercise but if we want to build bone density for them we want them to do gymnastics and tennis and things where they're actually striking their heel strikes the ground they're jumping up and down doing those kinds of activities actually banks more bone so that when you're 30, we're gonna start withdrawing from that account, whether we like it or not. We can fight it if you were doing resistance training when you were in your 30s and your 40s and you were, you've been doing it up to this point, you're much better off at this point. However, it's never too late. That's the other thing you've got to remember that you can start right now and there are, um, in the study that I shared on Wednesday last week, this is a study that was on males, but I think we can say, okay, we can extrapolate that. But males who didn't start exercising strenuously until they were in their 50s, after a decade, as long as they stayed with it, they caught up to their peers who've been exercising for their entire adult life. So we can catch up and that's an awesome thing to know that you're really not behind. If you start right now, we'll get there and you're gonna even the playing field. So be knowing that it's never too late. There are plenty of studies that even show that um, in, in your 90s, if you start exercising, strength training, resistance training, you can gain strength, muscle endurance. We're probably not going to be gaining a whole lot of bone density simply because there is so much unloaded time, meaning so much time resting, sleeping, sitting when we're older. But of course, the more active you are, the better the bone density is. But here's the math or the statistics, and you can do your own math, right? If you think about this, 
So we start somewhere at age 30. We start withdrawing from your bone bank one to three percent on average, one to three percent a year bone loss on average. But when women hit menopause, which is sometime a period of time, and we literally hit menopause, that's 12 months since your last period, you were in perimenopause, now you're in postmenopause. But there is a period of time at the end of perimenopause and the beginning of postmenopause that's about three to five years when you have accelerated bone losses of three to five percent every year. That's not three to five percent total, that's one to three percent every year from 30 until that point where you hit menopause. And then it's three to five percent every year during that period of time that might be three years for you and it might be four, maybe five on average. And then it slows back down. So we continue those losses one to 3% until. So this is all unless you're doing resistance training that does the job of slowing bone loss and potentially putting it back. So one of the biggest questions that I often get is, is it really possible to add bone density once you're in menopause or perimenopause? So here are the statistics. There are studies that show it is possible to add small amounts of bone density, which has a lot to do though, not solely with exercise alone, specifically resistance training, but has also to do with what is your diet? What are you doing or having to do for medications? Over-the-counter medication and or prescription medications may actually leach out more bone density. So those are things that you've got to consider on your own one-on-one -on -one basis. And I can't necessarily tell you exactly what that'll be, but it is possible. There have been small increases in bone density in people who've, women specifically, who've started strength training and are very conscientious about what it is they're eating and drinking, both in terms of what they're doing and what they're avoiding. So too much caffeine, you know, a little bit is fine, but too much actually will begin to rob your, your bones. So it's the too much caffeinated beverages, but we're talking, you know, if you're having three and four and you're drinking the cup or drinking, drinking the pot, not having a couple cups during the day, that's problematic. Um, ironically, do you want the good news? <laughs> <laughs> Ironically, for some of you, this will be good news, that someone who drinks moderately, one to two glasses for a woman, and the smaller size you are, you got to lean toward the one, are actually, you are less at risk for osteoporosis than those who don't drink at all or that who drink too much. So there you go. If you are looking for permission to have the glass of wine, in terms of bone density, you have it. Now, it may not help your blood sugar level, it may not help your belly fat. That's a whole separate thing, but you gotta weigh all the things together. But that gives you an idea of bone loss risk. And let's talk, how long do you plan on living, right? And you know, best ways to look are, look at you know what's your family history for, uh, say your mom, your grandmother, and you know those two in particular because the way we've lived the lifestyles we've had have changed so dramatically but you know yes lifespan expectancy is somewhere around 77 78 years but i think you will do better to look at your family history my uh grandmother lived to be 87 my mom is now a 94 um and doing great. I mean, she, she's, she's 94. She uses a walker to get around because she feels more comfortable. And so do we, right? When she's doing that, but you know, she lives in a, in an assisted living apartment, but she goes up and down the stairs and does her own laundry. And, you know, she may be here for a while. So she didn't exercise regularly throughout her life. She certainly didn't strength train. She's, you know, it, the whole philosophy of removing gluten and wheat and, you know, doing all those things, she does feel better. So she has 
you know, removing gluten and wheat products, trying to get her not to have quite so much chocolate. Um, she actually feels so much better when that's true, but she wasn't raised, you know, with that whole idea and that concept. We're kind of in the middle of it. We're being exposed to it. It's a choice and many of you have already gone there and your daughters and our, our daughters and sons will grow up knowing actually if I want to feel better, I should probably try that if something's not quite working for me. So every generation is potentially going to live a little bit longer. So I would definitely not just look at age expectancy, but look at your family history and the longevity that you have there. There used to be lines on your hands that you could read, right, to see how long you're going to live. But that's what you want to consider. What I want to do with the rest of this short time that I'm going to pop in is talk about the research about bone density and activities that will support your bone density most. And here's why. So it's not, it's not for me to convince you that here's what you should be doing, but I want to give you the information. And I also want to say this. So the elephant in the room is this, that just because I give you facts may not change your mind about what you're doing right now. And I fully acknowledge and recognize that that's true. So I want you to, in part because then it may have a different impact on you. But we are all very committed sometimes to the ideas that we have and the way that we have been thinking about things. And, and in, in some aspects, it's we like to be right and we don't want to have been wrong and been doing the wrong thing. And we may love the activities that we're doing and all of us resist change. So just know that even if I give you research facts and a way to think about research as you're getting it, you still may not just be able to take the statistics and that information and turn it into a different decision because you've got emotion tied to it and you have habit tied to it. And all I want you to do is kind of sit with that and let that go where it needs to go. But I will also share with you what I'm doing and what if I could get my sisters, sister-in-laws to do what I would wish for them to do. So basically every exercise is on a continuum. That's what you want to keep in mind. And somewhere along this continuum are you and the stress that you need. There is something called minimal effective stress. It's M-E-S. That's minimal effective stress. And what that means is everything responds to pressure, right? So what happens when you and I get pressure? We, we get stressed and we change. Our behavior changes, our mood changes, maybe our sleep changes. And that happens to every possible thing. So including bone, but we can take muscle and let's do that one first and then we'll come back to bone. So in order for your muscle to change, to change your body composition, to increase your muscle, decrease your body fat, change your metabolism by doing so, we have to work out. We have to lift weights that are heavier than things we normally lift and overload the muscle because it will respond by getting stronger between those exercise sessions. In the rest, when we, we sleep and we eat adequate calories, we eat adequate protein and adequate fruits and vegetables, emphasis on the vegetable part of that, okay? We need all of those things in order to help our body thrive and help the muscles grow, get stronger, recruit more muscle fibers. Well, the same thing is true of bone. So when we apply enough force, and sometimes the same force that we apply to muscle will help a bone, but not always. So if I wanted to pick up a really light weight, so I want you to imagine that I've got a two pound weight here. I, if I lifted that up and down, it's gonna take a whole lot more than 10 or 15 repetitions for me to reach fatigue. But if I go to 25 or 35, eventually, my bicep here is going to get tired. So I can do more repetitions with a light weight and reach muscle overload. That is not helping my bone. 
So I can reach muscular fatigue and I can help my muscle reach some kind of overload for muscle endurance, but it will not help my bone. In order to help bone, it has to be enough force of heavy weight or it can be a powerful weight and that means speed, a little movement, but it doesn't mean probably with two pounds can I go quickly and then down and that's not going to do it. It's going to take something really heavy that I can only do 10 or fewer times or it's going to take something slightly lighter than that that I can lift quickly and then let it come back down and lift quickly and then let it come back down. That's called power. And one other thing that I'll throw out there because somebody here inevitably has arthritis and you may be thinking I have arthritis or maybe I have fibromyalgia. I have to be careful about how much weight I lift otherwise I suffer for days after. You've got to then weigh advantages, risks and rewards. So we want to keep you in a point where you're under that threshold where it begins to cause you problems. So with your strength training, you may not be able to do 100% of the good that you can do with heavier weights simply because of your conditions. So knowing that, you're going to have to be more careful with your diet, be more careful with the things that may decrease your bone density and do what you can for muscle and for balance so that you can avoid falls that risk fracture and or result in fracture. So minimal effective stress, meaning this, that there's every exercise will help somebody. But when you read things like yoga or Pilates boost bone density or rebounding on a, a mini trampoline help bone density, they do and the research is correct, right? So it's not a matter of that research is a lie. That research is correct, but what you wanna be asking is, are those people just like me? So here's the difference. So let's talk about yoga. What happens with yoga? You know, it's a very quiet, there's no pickup, there's no stress, there's no pushing down. You're already on the ground. So it's a low impact activity, meaning it's going to have low impact on the bones also, right? So you're not going to have enough stress to actually make big changes. If you were right here, if you were on the couch and then you started doing yoga, instead of now being on the couch, you're doing better. You're getting bone density support. Does that make sense? So yes, the improvements in bone density come here, but you have to look back at that study that said yoga improves bone density and look at what were those people doing before the study? Anything at all? Were they doing anything? Were they just getting through their day, getting up, going to work, going back home, sitting on the couch, and then going to bed? Then that's going to help them. It's going to move them a little bit further down the road toward better bone density. But let's say you are a regular walker or a jogger even. Sometimes you, you do a little running and you've been doing weight training will suddenly starting yoga increase your bone density. It's really not referring to you because you are already over here doing higher impact activity on your feet. You're already doing higher stress on your bones by doing the strength training. So yoga is an amazing exercise, right? It's amazing exercise mode for oh so many reasons awesome for mobility, for decreasing your stress level, and for stabilizing, working on your core indirectly, helping you avoid falls because it will improve your balance depending on what type you do. And you may, if you're doing some down dog, you're putting some pressure on your wrist when you're down there. You may, this is called the wrist or the radius, which is a tested zone. Your wrist, your spine, and your hip joint or the femur neck are the three osteozones where usually testing is done to see what is your bone density, where is it at. And when you 
you know, lift weights, holding weights in your hands, you're pushing out, you're pulling back, you're putting stress on the wrist, so you're also getting some. But very few of us walk around on our hands anymore. Maybe you did once. I never could do that, but um, good for you. But those of you who did gymnastics as children, you have probably stronger bone density, better bone density in your wrists than those of us who didn't, um, simply because you banked more in there. So will you improve it here slightly? You might because you're, you're increasing something that you weren't doing before. But it's important to think about how does that apply to me? Is that really looking at me? So the same with Pilates. Pilates exercises, there are some research studies that will show that you can use Pilates to offset osteoporosis, but mu much of that is probably due more so to posture. So postural issues, so roundedness through this upper back, we call this part of your spine, your thoracic spine or your T-spine. And Pilates exercises also often help you get some mobility back in that upper back, that T-spine, and help you get your shoulders back where they belong, your shoulders down and away from your ears where they belong, so you're not so stressed and tense, but also help you straighten up and reduce the risk of additional fractures that can happen here and may already have happened. Even a sneeze for somebody who is more prone to osteoporosis with low bone density could cause a fracture or a, an abrupt cough could do the same thing. But if, again, if you're this person who already, you run and you, you do higher impact activities, maybe you do boxing activities and you actually kick and hit and you're moving in all kinds of directions, you're doing strength training, you're already here, Pilates adding to what it is you're already doing is right here with yoga. So if you were on the couch, then you start doing Pilates and you start doing yoga. Those are not a lot of stress on the bone. They are a little stress on the muscle pulling on the bone, but think about the drama, you know, and the trauma from muscle to bone. If we're talking yoga and Pilates, which most of us think of as these are gentle activities, not necessarily easy, but gentle activities on the body, working on alignment and it's got to be stressful. So strength training, where you're actually having to push hard and power through something, and there is a challenge there. When you're pushing, somebody pushing on you, you're gonna push back in the opposite direction, and that's exactly what has to happen for bone in order for it to respond and get stronger. So a gentle pressure for somebody who's already fairly fit is not gonna push you over the edge. So what I really want you to get at here is if you have a limited amount of time and you're looking at how do I make the most of 30 minutes or 45 when I have time to exercise, look at your priorities. Are they bone density? Are they lean muscle mass to change your metabolism? And decide based on those things what you do with that time. If you're just getting started in exercise and you know I do need to focus on my bone density ultimately, but right now exercise is not comfortable. Exercise feels bad. It's like something hurts if I move one day and I exercise then I don't feel good the next. Then actually this may be good use of your time, the yoga and the Pilates to put you back into better alignment better mobility. So the exercise and the doing more down here actually makes more sense later. So you have to, if you haven't been exercising for years, you don't have to do it all today, all this week or all this month. You just have to take that step-by-step -step process and get there. So things that are over here closer to the middle, I want to talk a little bit about cardiovascular exercises. So sometimes we get confused with weight bearing exercise and weight resistance exercise. So let's talk about the weight bearing and then we'll talk about resistance. So with cardio, that's where we're really talking about weight bearing exercises. So 
An example of weight bearing, so pop quiz. Are you ready for this? Okay, so if I said to you, swimming and tennis, which one of those is a weight bearing exercise? Or which one is more weight bearing? Probably a better way to ask. Okay. So, and I see your question, Daryl, does walking help? And I'm gonna come back and answer that probably right now, we're gonna get there. So if you've got an answer to that question, which one of those is more weight bearing, swimming or tennis? Okay, and the answer is tennis, right? Because you're literally feet on the ground, putting force, kind of moving around, right? Let's shield the winner, okay? Tam is second, awesome. So definitely tennis. Actually in the water, we remove the effect of gravity and you don't get nearly as much bone density benefit, except if you're this person. You're this person not exercising at all. Previously sedentary, you haven't been doing anything for years. If we put you in the water and we have you doing movements where you're resisting the water and trying to forcefully move the water, it will help you. But after a certain point, you will reach a minimum effective stress. And the idea would be we need to get you out of the pool and onto land so that gravity is a bigger force. And now you're actually in charge of 100% of your body and you're moving it against gravity. So not everybody can play tennis. I think we can agree with that, that your knees or your hips or your ankles may be saying not happening, right? And maybe skill, you've never learned it. So that's not really even something that appeals to you. So the point isn't which one you should do, it's just comparing. So on the continuum, where, where do we start? Somebody asked, does walking help? Walking helps if you've been on the couch right so if you haven't been walking at all starting a walking program will be much more helpful than what you were doing is walking as helpful as jogging or jump roping no and no even a little dancing right because you leave the ground a little bit when you dance at least i do right is that just me <laughs> um and then when you look at things like so jump roping is really good if you can, if you're not already at risk for osteoporosis, and all of those are weight bearing exercises. But let's talk about, even though we're at home, most of us, and some of us have things at home to use, but let's talk about an elliptical trainer. And let's talk about a Stairmaster. Um, and those are probably the two biggest. I'll touch on some others in a second. But your feet are in it on an elliptical trainer and then you're just going back and forth. How would you classify that? I'm going to ask you to think about that and then I'll give you the answer. But do you think that's weight bearing or not? And then think about the same thing. So a Stairmaster could have dated myself. We don't see a lot of those. What you see now is a step mill, which is actually better for bone density. And the difference is, so back to the elliptical as well, when you pick your feet up and put them down, it's the heel strike that helps you get more bone density. You need that to land on something. So if you're walking on a treadmill or outdoors, or you're jogging, or you're picking your feet up to walk upstairs, or your um, hiking outdoors, all of those things have a little bit of heel strike to them. So there's more bone density benefit to them, right? However, we still will get to the point where we have problem because we will reach this minimum effective stress. So your body weight and mine, we don't want them to go up, most of us, right? All right, so we may, have, we may be dealing with that because of quarantine 15, but we, most of us don't want them to go up. So that's the only way to get more stress and more load if we're walking is for us to weigh more. So a solution might be to wear a weighted vest while you're walking. Please don't put hand weights, don't carry hand weights. Two pounds, first of all, are not gonna do anything to your overall weight and 
bone density, but they will put stress on your wrist, your elbow, and your shoulders. Definitely not worth it. Come home, lift weights for five or 10 minutes and you get a better deal. But walking has a minimum effect of stress. So once you're able to walk a mile, two miles, three miles, walking more or more days per week is not going to help your bone density. You've reached that threshold where more of the same does not help. And likewise, for those of you that are runners, so running is different than walking. So when walking, the way we classify that as exercise physiologists and kinesiologists is you're on the floor. Some foot is in contact with the floor the whole time. There's no impact to it, right? So the difference between walking and running is you have air time. You're off the ground, so you land with more force. Now, some of you have probably heard for years that the force when you run is so much worse on your knees. Well, some of that is good because it's adding bone density, right? But even that, if you can run a mile and you run two miles or three miles or five miles regularly, doing it more is not going to improve your bone density more. You've already reached this. Your body is now adapted and it's used to that kind of stress. It already pushed back, but you're not giving it more stress. You're just giving it more frequent stress. See the difference? So you've got to figure out how can I load more? So the, the optimal answer is strength training. Strength training is the biggest and the best. And strength training can be done here. It can be done here can be done here when you're right fresh off the couch. You don't start heavy, but we build up to it. So you still overload yourself in a way that's safe and progressive so we don't hurt you, we start helping you, and we progressively go as heavy as you can. If you have arthritis, we're gonna reach that, this is as heavy as I can go, sooner than you might on other joints there that are not bothered by um, arthritis. Uh, so things to think about. So always, no matter what else you're doing, resistance training, strength training. So let me touch a little bit on this, the difference between what is resistance training, because I know that's a question for some. So is that is that Pilates? Like if you're pulling on things or you're doing Pilates, is that resistance training? I get asked that one. What about tubing? I will get asked that one as well. And what about free weights, dumbbells? versus machine weights at a gym which we may or may not want to do right now because if we do you know we're either in a mask or we don't want to be in a mask or we're going and other people are not in a mask and we wish they were in a mask and there's the whole thing right so you like me may have quit the gym that's just my choice you may have a clean quiet gym that's hardly used and you feel very safe and comfortable in it so let me give you the continuum on strength training, okay? So I'm gonna read a couple questions and see if there is anything that I missed in terms of cardio. says, my mother has osteoporosis. Do I have a heredity risk or and I avoid it by my choices? I'm 60. So depending on when your mom got it. So if she got it before she was, you know, 50, then you have more family history. But if she got it when she was 60 or 70 or 80, you really, you can't point to the fact that you have family history. So I would say to yourself, no, I don't, and I can change it, because that's the best thing. And your father, your father will catch up. It's a great question, but your, you know, females are much more at risk than males, because number one, we are lighter in weight to begin with. Our bones are not quite as thick and dense. Our frame is not as thick and dense, so we are already kind of behind the eight ball before we even get there. But, and we have estrogen that protects us until we don't. So when we go through menopause, then um, Tam, estrogen no longer is there to protect us. So as we lose rapidly, that three to five percent over three to five years. So do the math, at its very worst, that's losing 25% of your bone density. 
that's a tremendous amount making you very vulnerable men don't go through that so even if we said nine percent for three years you lost three percent the the least of the losses that's still a significant amount of bone loss and men don't have it but we do catch up so somewhere around 70 or 75 men definitely by 80 are as vulnerable to osteoporosis as women now not talking special health circumstances so if you um, have had a man in your family who's been taking steroidal drugs because they need to probably for life supporting um, a diagnosis but if they've been on steroids that will um, probably mean osteoporosis for them so I have a brother who in his early 40s um, had been on steroids for um, years in a row and so he's got osteoporosis he's got a metal plate in his back but that's a very unusual circumstance right so um, a lot of things that come into play there so if your mom is older then probably not if she got osteoporosis when she was older and here's the thing <laughs> I've had you know a lot of our members in the flipping 50 membership we just had this discussion that you know when you get a diagnosis because you've just had your first bone scan in many cases it's just time it's the year that they'll do it and that'll be covered by insurance and you realize you have osteoporosis it really makes you angry or upset or feels like somebody just pulled a rug out from under you because you think I'm an active person I eat well I've been doing everything the right way I don't smoke and I don't drink and you know I'm not blonde and fair skinned and blue eyed and why is this happening to me it feels a little like you were robbed however here's the thing and don't let this alarm you but most of us probably have lower bone density than we might imagine we really need to you know realize that we need to do everything we can right now to treat ourselves as if we are apparently healthy and we don't know it because otherwise as soon as you get scared you will get nervous you'll stop doing things that you need to be doing but you know it's also wise to be smart so none of us really should be doing BLT and that is bending lifting and twisting at the same time so sometimes we have to be careful even about yoga movements right think of yoga many of you who are doing it bending lifting and twisting there are several moves where we do that sometimes and you need to know who you are and whether or not you should be doing that at all but other things like lifting heavy weights and prioritizing that over Zumba sometimes, right? And making sure that you're making the right choices. If you have yoga and you have Pilates and you have strength training and you have high intensity intervals to choose from, your biggest bang for your buck in terms of return on investment of time and energy for muscle and for bone is strength training number one and also mobility and flexibility increases. Did you know that? When you strength train, and a lot of people used to think that that would decrease your mobility, but you're going through full range of motion. You're using those muscles and ligaments contacting the joints. It's actually amazing for all three things plus your brain. So it's a must. And then high intensity interval training, whether or not it's high impact doesn't matter, but there is some minor benefit even to bone density with high intensity interval training and certainly to the muscle that supports it and helps you have more agility and reaction skills, okay? So I'm gonna ask that if you have questions, please just add them in the comments if you can and I will um, answer them. Lady with Gratitude has a comment on pH. Yes, pH is um, a great one to mention, so thanks for adding that if you are so that I mentioned you've got to get adequate protein for muscle you've got to get adequate we don't know that you need adequate calcium from dairy but you need it from all sources and you need a balanced pH level meaning if you're eating a lot of acetic foods like coffee um, too much of it too much wine and alcohol too much animal protein and not that we can avoid that completely and I, those of you who are vegan I apologize but 
for those of you that are eating now, we need sources of protein and we need to balance that out with tons of vegetables. So if you're skimping in the vegetable department, you've got to get that back in there. So in the last five to seven years, you know, I do a bone health mini course and I often will do a circuit and travel and give presentations to different groups on osteoporosis. Very recently, we have given up this whole, it's got to be about calcium and magnesium and vitamin D alone. It's actually, it's got to be a balanced diet and you need far more protein than we ever used to talk about in the conversation with osteoporosis. Because if you don't have that, you can't boost everything else that has to happen, both for the bone and the muscle that supports the bone. And so you've got to have muscle to do the things that will get you the bone density, right? So all of it is connected as opposed to we've isolated this problem and here's what we do or this problem and here's what we do. Overall, it really is pointing back to the same things. After 50, strength training, high intensity interval training, getting breathless is very important. If you can do it with high impact activity, fantastic. If you can't, it doesn't matter anything. Any mode of exercise can be made high intensity intervals, but those things will also help you. And then mobility and maintaining that would be great. So I'm gonna read a question or a comment. Catherine says, I do the weight training and though I know the muscle is stronger, I don't look any fitter or defined. It's been two years with little change. Okay, how's the rest of your diet or things I would ask Catherine and um, looking at your stress level and your sleep level also would be really important and you know really sitting down to go through a food log would be um, something i would do is go over at each of three meals are you getting that adequate protein and are you timing it appropriately and what's happening with your hormones would be the last question on there so you may want to take a deeper dive and look at your hormones so if your stress level is up your estrogen is tanking testosterone is tanking progesterone is tanking those things are, you know, time for a decision. Do you want help and support? And sometimes that's the best way. And you'll see a change dramatically right away if you need a boost. If you can say, I am doing every lifestyle change possible, got the protein at every meal, I'm sleeping really well, prioritizing that, doing the exercise, the strength training to fatigue with heavy weights, and I reach fatigue in every single set, I'm doing high intensity interval training and I'm not doing endurance exercise, all things that will kill your best body composition, then it might be that you wanna look at, do I wanna test my hormones, see where I'm at and get a little support? So, um, you know, it's I think every woman's decision and right to make that decision um, based on what you feel is best for you. So, I don't see any questions here, so let me just give a really quick summary of, we went through a lot of things um, hopefully in an organized fashion so you can make sense of them. But I'm talking about bone losses, most important. You know, you're not doing anything to cause it. It's happening. It is a fact of aging. If you don't do anything about it, it will continue and the aging will take over. But if you're lifting weights and you're eating right, sleeping right, you can reverse some of those problems with bone density and or slow and stop further losses of bone density in the future. We lose about one to 3% every year starting at the age of 30 till we hit menopause. And as females going through menopause, we can lose three to 5% bone density every year while we're in that peak three to five years, then we'll slow down and resume those slower losses of one to 3% again for the rest of our lives. And that's where we tend to about here, 75 or 80, we balance out with men. So we're both on the way to you know, needing balance, needing more bone density and needing to be smarter in the way we exercise. Will Pilates and yoga help boost your bone density? If you are just coming off the couch and you haven't been doing anything, sure, they will put you somewhere here on the continuum. But if you're already an active person, already walking a lot, hiking a lot, jogging a lot, doing jump ropes sometimes, dancing around in your living room, is yoga and Pilates going to add more bone density? Probably not. 
it doesn't count as resistance training. You have to put enough stress on that bone. The repetition range is ideally 10 or fewer repetitions to fatigue, meaning the weight is so heavy, you can't lift more than 10. That's the gold standard for bone density. If you can lift 20 times a lighter weight, it does not have the same bone density application. It will help muscle, but it won't help bone. And yet your condition, whatever is happening for you right now, be it arthritis, fibromyalgia, maybe just prior injuries, may dictate that at certain joints you can't lift heavy, but try not to let that dissuade you from lifting heavy in other joints where you can. And remember loading the hip, doing things like walking, jogging, um, up to a point, but then you won't win anymore, doing squats and doing lunges and overloading that way. While you're at home picking up heavier weights, heavier dumbbells, and I'm gonna show a few videos over this next week that will demonstrate how can you lift heavier while you're at home, what are some ways, some tools that you may be able to buy if you're interested, but also just ways you can get creative because your body does not know that you're lifting a dumbbell or a kettlebell or a backpack full of books, right? Your body doesn't know. It will still respond to it just the same. So I gave away, spoiler alert, so one of the things that you can do to get creative, and, and I think I got that from one of our members who was at home and couldn't, couldn't get her hands on dumbbells, so who knew the world would have a dumbbell shortage in the midst of all of this, but true story. Okay, so quick reminder that this is the last weekend for 50% off if you need a strength training program and one that you can do at home there are dumbbells involved though so you need three sets of dumbbells and you will will like it more if you have a big ball so one of the big 65 centimeter balls will also support you but right now it's at um, $97 as opposed to $197 regularly, and this is the last weekend for it. So we start October 1st. That means 12 weeks. It will take you right to Christmas or New Year's, actually. You'll enter 2021 feeling better, potentially boosting your bone density a little bit, definitely boosting your lean muscle mass. So if you're interested in a little bit of support, there you have it. There's one way to get it. Okay. So we are on our way into a Sunday evening over here. I hope I answered some questions about bone density, how to get started, and how to make the most sense. So in terms of research, what you need to ask, if you see a study or somebody writes an article about a study that says yoga boosts bone density or Pilates boosts bone density, make sure that you ask who were the subjects I mean, did they just come out of bed? Did they just come off the couch? Or had they been actively exercising and lifting weights before they started? So you wanna ask, are they like me? And often we don't get that story. They may tell us the numbers, like they studied 500 women or they studied 100 women, and 500 is a better number of randomized study subjects, but it still doesn't tell you, were they like me? So can you say the yoga or the Pilates is helping your bone density? So beyond a certain point, if you've adapted to it and you do it, it won't be helping you grow anymore. You've got to continue to get some resistance. So last but not least, some of you might be saying, well, I can't continue to lift heavier and heavier weights. It's true, but we can change the sequence of the weights. And we can, instead of, for instance, lifting heavier, so imagine I have dumbbells here and I'm lifting heavier and just going slowly, we can lift with power and then still control them coming back. So lifting with power has also been shown to affect the bone more positively. And that even you can go a little bit lighter on that weight and still changing the sequence, changing the way that we do it or the strategy and technique that we do it allows you to have kind of an infinite number of ways to mix things up that will help bone density. So I hope that was helpful. If you have any more questions, you can, can come back, post them here. I will pop back in 
And um, Tam says, so walking with a backpack full of books works as a weighted vest. It works to some extent. So in a little video I'm gonna share, Tam, and I'll just share this with you now. So the difference is if I wear a weighted vest, it is on my body. My center of gravity hasn't changed. If I have a backpack on, my center of gravity has changed. So it's a little bit more stressful to your spine, to your shoulders, and it takes you off of balance. So you ideally though could lift that as a weight. So if you can't get heavy enough weights, you don't have dumbbells, you can pull this up and down. Wearing the backpack is not something I would do on a regular basis. So we know this from studying students on campus, even women wearing purses, right, on one shoulder. And a backpack, if you have it on both shoulders, you'll be better off. But we also know that if they're overloaded, we you know, tend to have problems either with the core, the lower back, and we get out of alignment. So you just wanna be careful about that. And you know, putting one on the back and one on the front would be better, okay? Hopefully that helps. All right, thanks everybody. Have a great rest of your Sunday night. The Stronger Program, if you wanna see details about that, is flipping50, all words spelled out, dot com forward slash get stronger. And this is the last weekend that it's still at 50% off. If you need muscle, boost that metabolism, or building bone density for at home, got you covered. All right, have a great evening.